Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Do you believe the prophets of Israel? I'm speaking about biblical prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Joel, and all the rest. Do you believe that they heard from God and they accurately, correctly revealed to us exactly what God had commanded them to speak? I believe that. And when we base our theology upon prophecy, all of God's word, you're going to see that there are certain things that you have to accept. And one of these things is that God is not finished with Israel. Neither the land of Israel, it still has biblical significance for the future. God is going to do things in the land of Israel. Secondly, we know that God is not finished with the Jewish people. He is going to move in a unique way according to his prophetic promises in order to bring a remnant of Israel to faith. The same faith in that gospel message. He's going to bring one-third of those who are still alive in the last days of the house of Jacob. He is going to bring them to faith. Faith in the work of Messiah. So those individuals that teach a replacement theology, that God has has casted Israel aside and replaced them with the church, this is not the case. God's covenantal promises to Israel is still in force. And his faithfulness in regard to those promises are going to be a testimony to the world that God is truthful. He is faithful. He is dependable. Well, with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to the book of Isaiah and chapter 54. Now, we began this chapter last week, and we're going to complete it, God willing, this week. We completed the first eight verses last week, and now we're going to begin in verse 9. And again, it begins with judgment we're going to see a reference to the flood during the days of Noah. And what we know is that this judgment in the days of Noah was not for punishing all of humanity, but those who received the punishment were those who would not respond to God's revelation. How to respond? Believe it. And allow that faith to lead you to enter into the ark. Only Noah, his wife, his three children, and their wives, these eight individuals, only they responded. And God used the floodwaters not for the purpose solely of destroying, but for cleansing, for purifying. And what we find biblically is this, that it's the judgment of God that will put things in God's order a righteous order, an order that will bring about the establishment of the kingdom of God. And for that kingdom to come, we're going to see that God first is going to keep his covenantal promises to Israel. Well, let's begin. Look with me to verse 9, Isaiah chapter 54 and verse 9. We read here, For the waters of Noah. Now, these floodwaters had a purpose. They reveal a great deal. But notice what God says about these floodwaters prophetically. He says, this is to me which I have sworn, meaning simply, this is an oath that I have taken concerning the floodwaters of Noah. 
he has promised this i have sworn from passing the waters of noah again upon the earth so god has sworn he's taken that oath that never again will the waters of noah the flood pass over the earth it is not going to happen again now does that mean god will not destroy the earth no didn't say that he's simply not going to do it with water we know that eventually fire is going to be used for god's judgment in the last days also fire that that refining that another form and methodology for purifying god wants things pure meaning according to his standards his will his purposes so a promise not again will the flood waters pass over the earth and then he says as we keep reading the second part of the verse thus i have sworn and there's another oath that he's taken and he says from wrath upon you meaning this god has sworn in the same way that the waters of the flood is not going to judge the earth again he's promising here that his wrath will not be upon israel now we're speaking about a kingdom perspective god's judgment's going to bring about a kingdom reality there's going to be that remnant of israel that will be part of the kingdom and never 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 again will israel experience the wrath of god god is stating that prophetically and we can believe it then he says nor rebuking you so we're dealing with a time when israel in a unique way that they are going to be transformed into kingdom people there's going to be no need for god's judgment his wrath upon them and he's not going to have to rebuke them anymore it speaks about a change a godly change a holy change a righteous change in other words a kingdom change that is coming upon israel and when that kingdom change comes upon israel we can be assured that the kingdom is going to be established that's the order that's the work that's left for god to do among some other things but ultimately the kingdom will not come until israel is transformed now that's why the enemy and i'm speaking about surah hamashiach that is the antichrist wants to woo court pull israel away from god because he believes that if israel will worship him submit to him that will foil god's purpose and the kingdom won't be established and he won't be destroyed it's god's prophetic truth that tells us no satan you are going down you are defeated already and god's judgment will come will put things in a godly order and you will not be part of that kingdom let's press on to the next verse verse 10. for the mountains will will be removed and the hills they will collapse so two things now normally in the natural we don't think of mountains moving we don't think of hills collapsing that's that's unheard of naturally but there's coming a change this is foundational in this second part of the prophecy god's going to move according to his prophetic word and he's going to bring about changes in this world changes that no one imagined no one thought of when looking at things naturally if you look at things prophetically you know they're going to happen you can expect them you can mark it down and know that they will take place so the mountains they're going to be removed the hills they're going to collapse but now this is an instance when that that conjunction ve in hebrew is used in a unique way context demands that we understand it with a modern hebrew word and that is the word aval which means but or in contrast to so where the mountains and the hills are going to be changed 
They're going to move in a different way. They're going to become different. God says, in contrast to that, he says, my grace. So important that we see that. My grace, he promises, from you shall not be removed. Now, the word here, chesed, in this case, it's in the first person possessive. So it's chasdi my grace very important term grace oftentimes we think about it just in the new covenant but we see it here in the tanakh the hebrew bible and god promises and this is really why these other things are going to happen god is going to extend grace to the jewish people in fulfillment of his covenant obligations there is going to be a remnant a remnant of the house of Jacob, the Jewish people that received that. And because of that, God, just like he says to to believers throughout the world, that he's not going to take his grace away from us. So he says, but my grace from you will not be removed. And in addition to that, a covenant of my peace. Now, if you read it, my covenant of peace that's incorrect it literally says a covenant of my peace will not collapse said it's in the past and we learned last week that is to show something that is assured that's going to happen you can take it to the bank you can count on it so god is saying his covenant of of peace is not going to to collapse it's going to endure It's not going to give out. It's not going to fade away. It's not going to fail. So when he says, a covenant of my peace, peace has to do with the will of God. So God is going to bring about, and it's the covenant, being in a covenantal relationship with him, that that gives us the assurance that God's will is going to be realized, experienced, made known in our life and through our life and to our life, that we can be assured of this. It's his promise and then finally it says said meaning here he's speaking about how these things are assured said the one who is merciful unto you the lord so it's the lord and it's significant it does not say god but lord and this name lord in this context means god who is is always was is and will be god who transcends all things so his statement and the use of that term yudhe vafe for lord that sacred name of god implies to us there is nothing god transcends all things so there is nothing that is able to to cause this not to be the reality god is going to be merciful he is promised and he is able and nothing is going to interfere with God's mercy being extended to us. Now let's move to verse 11. Verse 11 talks about that this transformation is going to have some, some personal implications to each believer. And we're speaking about a transformation that's going to happen to Israel, whereby Israel is going to be made ready not just made ready but made glorious for her husband so look at verse 11 speaking about israel he says now in this present time and previously israel has been afflicted he says oh afflicted one and then the next word is a word for being tossed and literally it's a word for a tempest or storm now you can imagine that oftentimes a storm comes in and as an outcome of that storm whether it's a tornado a hurricane whatever things are changed things can be tossed here and there by these strong winds things come about differently as a result of the storm and he's saying to israel you have been afflicted you have been been tossed about and he says you have not been comforted now that's in that present time 
all the way up to the last days until the return of Messiah, until Israel, that remnant, receives the gospel. She has not been comforted. Now, this word for being comforted is uniquely related in the book of Isaiah to the work of Messiah. And we see it in the New Covenant, that word for comforted is related to the same phrase where Messiah, when he began his earthly work, he went down from the upper Galilee, that is, from the high places in the Galilee, uh, Nazareth, he went to Kephar Nehum, or Capernaum. And Capernaum is related to this word. Capernaum, the village of comfort. So he went from Nazareth, which is elevated, now, there's a, a upper gallery and a lower gallery. Nazareth actually is in the lower gallery, but it's elevated high. It's at a high altitude. It's on mountain. So that's why we, we speak of it as up above, but it's in the lower portion, the southern portion of the Galilee. Look again. He says, says she has not been comforted. Behold, I am... Uh, setting down your stones of a splendor. Now, this is a word for, for perhaps engraving, laying down stones in something that gives it a beauty. It's decorative. It is similar to, to perhaps a woman who, who uses colors and such in makeup to, to accent herself. Well, God is saying, he's promising that Israel is going to be made beautiful in his eyes. That Israel is going to be prepared for that kingdom condition. So so he's going to to set in place your stones of, of splendor. And then he says, I have founded you with sapphires, another stone. And he's going to speak about a few more in a moment. It all has to do with the beautification, let's say it spiritually, the glorification of, of the house of Israel. Now let's press on to verse 12. Same subject. I will set ruby, and it's in the sense of plural, it's singular, but in the plural mindset. I will set ruby in your, your window frame. Now the point is, that oftentimes a window is used as kind of a like a picture frame and around the window sill and around the frame of the window he's going to put in these fine stones these these rubies and secondly it speaks about and your gate your gates with stones that are precious some say that this is stones of crystal if we look at this word that's used here so the gates are going to be made of fine crystal then he says and all your border all your borders stones of of desire stones that are precious the same concept of gems fine fine stones that are are precious in nature so Israel is going to be transformed. She is going to be made glorious as a requirement for the kingdom to be established. Verse 13. Now, we've dealt with kind of an outward presentation, an outward change of the people. But there's also going to be an inner change as well. And that inner change is seen, depicted in verse 13. Notice what, what the prophet writes, verse 13. And all your children are learned of the Lord. Now we can say taught by the Lord or learned in the things of the Lord. Now let me ask you a question. What are the benefits of, of knowing the Lord? Being trained and learned in the, the truth of the living God. Well, notice what he says. This 13th verse, the first part works with the second. It's teaching us a principle. When we are learned of the Lord, we understand him, we know him, we, we read his word, we can, can 
know certain things about the attributes and the behavior the will of god that the scripture reveals and when we truly learn it and implement that in our life and out of our life notice what it says it says an abundant peace of your children so when you are learned in the lord it is going to produce abundant peace now the word peace biblically speaking is related to the will of god so as i am trained by the lord and of the lord and in the lord i'm going to live and experience abundant peace god's will i'm going to be in the center of i'm going to be faithful to his objectives his commandments now if you're not in god's will good things are not going to happen realize one of the main objectives of the enemy is to get you out of god's will get you doing the things that are against his purposes and his plans in god's will we find his blessings we find his provision we find that we are taught his perspective so we need to be in the will of god next verse verse 14 in righteousness you will be established and you are far from from oppression now here again another principle that we see don't miss that what he's saying is this in righteousness god will establish you and as an outcome of that you are going to be far from oppression now we who walk in the will of god we are going to be be subject to the attacks of the enemy they're going to want to hinder us uh, afflict us cause us grief bring about discouragement and the like and what god's promising is this he says here in righteousness and there's an inherent relationship between righteousness and the will of god not just knowing the will of god but doing the will of god and when that happens despite the enemy's intent and desire despite that he promises he promises that we're going to be far from being oppressed in other words and i would write this down learn this truth there is safety and security in god's will the most dangerous place for a person to be is outside of god's will doing what we want to do believing that we're chasing our desires pursuing our so-called destiny let me just share with you that when i hear someone uses the word destiny and the dream that i have for my life those individuals are usually deceived let's use biblical words that that are are better which is god's plan for my life when we start saying destiny that's kind of a a fatalism if you don't know what fatalism is look it up it's kind of saying that that everything has been determined this is this is the plan for my life and usually that plan what people think is their destiny what what they're dreaming about it all originates in self meaning that that the enemy put there the enemy put it there and it's from the pit of hell what we need to realize is that the will of god is revealed to us in the midst of obedience hear that and hear it well the will of god will be for your life revealed to you the will of god for your life is revealed to you in obedience to the word of god the commandments of god if you're not and again important principle if you're not obeying god you are not going to have a perspective in order to hear see and learn god's will for your life and let me share with you another very important principle and we see examples of that primarily in the new covenant if if you are are in a marriage and that marriage does not reflect god's character god's purposes for marriage it is going to hinder and that failure in marriage may disqualify you from serving as god wanted you to serve now here's what people think 
well i sense a call on my life okay maybe you have that call in your life and you've heard god correctly but then something happens in your life you disobey god your your marriage falls apart and such that can disqualify you from that that call that god has on your life it may not low any longer be available or proper for you now that doesn't mean god stops loving you that does not mean that god won't forgive you he loves you he will forgive you but but you may be called now to do something else that that god's utmost purposes for you cannot be be any longer embraced because of failure in other words people don't like to hear this i'm sure people are going to be angry about this we're going to get responses from people but realize that there are consequences to disobedience and even though and here again a difficult thing for people to understand but i can fail god and god can forgive me and he will totally by his grace his mercy because of the gospel i can be absolutely forgiven but there still may be consequences from that earthly consequences and maybe eternal consequences we can suffer loss because of our disobedience so people need to make a a very important covenantal relationship with god which says god it's about you not me it's about your standards not mine And I understand that if I disobey you, that there can be consequences, things can be lost that cannot be regained. Does God disown us? He does not. But there's consequences and people need to acknowledge that. So he says, in righteousness, you will be established and far away from oppression, righteousness moves us away from oppression for you will not fear this next word has to do with uh uh, not giving other things priority so he says for you will not fear and disaster or terror this word can mean a few different things destruction as well all these things it says for it will not come near unto you now in my bible i kind of highlight that because it gives me encouragement it is comforting to know that that if i surrender to god if i'm committed to his will then this word which means disaster destruction fear terror all these things it says it will not come near to me now we're going to be moving into the concluding verses of this 54th chapter of isaiah and there's some wonderful promises here that should give us assurance and these promises first and foremost they're made to israel that they're going to become a reality for the house of jacob let's move on to the next verse verse 15 behold he will dwell now here it's speaking about the enemy realize this principle when a person is committed to god when a person is walking in faith when a person is is believing god's instructions and doing them with his life that person oftentimes is going to be under attack what did we learn in the previous verse do not fear for that destruction that that uh, disaster that hardship it's not going to draw near to you but there is an enemy and he will want to dwell in your presence meaning this he will want to come alongside why he wants to afflict you he wants to toss you about he wants to cause you problem he's attacking but he says here even though that happens notice the next phrase let me read it in Hebrew. Ephes me ot. Ephes means nothing, zero. And this enemy, it's not from God. God didn't send him. God didn't want this. None of this is from God. 
It's not from him or about him. And therefore, we can know something. Notice the last part of that first word says, who dwells with you. This one who comes, this enemy, who comes to dwell with you, meaning it enters into your life, this enemy. It says, unto you or before you is how I like to translate this. Before you, he will fall. God says, this is not my purpose. This is not my doing. This enemy, I didn't send. And therefore, what happens? Before you, he will fall. God will bring about his defeat and your victory. And what's your victory? Obeying God. Now, again, this is a a concept that's foreign in many places where there's supposed to be places of faith, in local assemblies, in houses of worship. What we find is obedience obedience and victory i have received victory through messiah in order that i can obey god very important biblical truth victory is so i can obey god so obedience is victory and secondly another aspect of victory and we talked about this not too long ago in another teaching and that is this victory is also related to worshiping God. As long as I'm worshiping God, I may have failed God, I may have let God down, I may have rebelled, I may have sinned, but if I turn from that, confessing my sin, asking forgiveness, trusting in that blood of Messiah which cleanses me and brings about forgiveness of all of my sins, you know what that? brings about in my life a desire to worship god to thank god to praise god and the point is this you can suffer some defeat in your life that's disobedience but if you return repent and worship god the enemy is not going to have the battle he is going to lose that battle he is not going to be triumphant so we need to remember that this is not from God and eventually that enemy is going to fall before before us. Now look at verse 16. Here he's talking about uh, two, two workers. And notice what he says. Let's just read this verse first and then we'll draw some conclusions. Verse 16. Behold, I have created, and we could think of this as a craftsman maybe based upon context, a blacksmith who blows with fire coal. So this one is working. He's working with fire and coal to to produce something. And it says, he brings forth a vessel for his work. So we have someone who's building. Now, there's another one. And who is that? Well, look at the next part of the verse. He says, and I have created mashchit lechabel, which means, and in addition to this, I have created the destroyer to destroy. Now, it's literally two different words for destruction. One is a word of wiping things away, destroying them, leaving no evidence of them, annihilation. And the second word, is is used in modern hebrew for a terrorist one who loves to cause pain and hardship and suffering it's terror for the sake of terror it's harming someone for the sake of harming and this is what god is saying here i've created the the craftsman the worker what does he do he does that which is is profitable that which has a purpose that which is edifying he contributes something and he's going to work he's got his vessel in order to do his work so there's one for edification but there's also the destroyer the destroyer is going to destroy those things that are not in line with god's word let me give an example we see in egypt we see that same phrase the destroyer 
being used for Passover night. When, when at midnight we find that that judgment of destruction went out upon the firstborn. So destruction, it has a purpose. God is going to, to do this. He's looking at your life and my life and he's seeing what is it that I can build up and what is it that needs to be torn down that which is in opposition to the kingdom the kingdom character and now let's go to our last verse 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 17 a verse that's known to most of us a verse of encouragement a verse that has a wonderful promise that gives to us assurance again i want to say that again it's a verse that gives us a wonderful promise of god's faithfulness that we don't need to fear the enemy but we need to give priority to god we need to be about his work committed to his will and when we are walking walking in the the promises of god then we don't need to worry about what the enemy is up to look at verse 17 every vessel formed against you now in the original context this is for israel but realize in the same way that in egypt a mixed multitude came out and they had the same call and they had the same reward waiting for them this can be applied to all believers but in its original context it's to israel and he says and this gives us hope in the last days why well the enemy knows that that israel is foundational for god's purposes his plan his will to be to be made a reality and therefore the enemy is going to work harshly and diligently against israel but the enemy won't be successful why notice what god says every vessel that's formed against you it will not succeed some bibles will say will not prosper these vessels against us are not going to successfully be used against us it's not going to have the the stated objective of the enemy and then he says keep reading and every tongue that rises up against you for judgment shall be condemned so we have two promises number one the weapons that that the enemy wants to use against us for our demise our destruction our shame whatever they are not going to be successful they are not going to have any any outcome against god's covenant people and then secondly the words words of of accusing words of of shame words of of defeat he says and also every tongue that that rises up against you for judgment meaning this god's going to justify god's not going to to judge in this in this case this judgment is for condemnation such words such a tongue that rises up is going to be condemned it's going to be convicted and now let's let's look at how this chapter ends it says zot now zot is the feminine form for the word this in english we simply have this it's neither masculine or feminine is used in both but in hebrew we can have a masculine this and a feminine this we can have a singular this and a plural this and what god is saying is this when the word zot is used and it stands alone it implies this is the main objective this is the primary point and here's what he says this is the inheritance of the servants of the lord and your righteousness is with me declares the lord now this last phrase is so wonderful because he says this is the inheritance of who the servants of the lord 
Now, how should we rightly divide the Word of God here? Well, you say initially, and this is what I taught and what I believe, it initially had to do with, with Israel, the Jewish people, these promises. But it ends with the phrase, the servants of the Lord. Now, don't uh, cast out Israel. What it tells us is that Israel is going to be made into the servants of the Lord. They're going to have this wonderful heritage from the Lord. And then finally it tells us that in the end, they are also going to be righteous ones, it says. And their righteousness is from who? From me. This is what we've talked about earlier, where God's going to impute believers with the very righteousness of his son, the righteousness of God. So Israel is going to be made one day the righteousness of God, and so will all believers in Messiah Yeshua. And then it ends, Neum Hashem, which is a term of promise. It says, declares the Lord. And what the Lord declares, it is for sure. We can have assurance that this is going to be the reality. Well, chapter 54 of the book of Isaiah, a wonderful chapter that affirms God's promises to Israel, both what he's going to do with the people and that he's going to bring them back to the land. So let's not be deceived by false theology, but let's be individuals that embrace truth, prophetic truth, and be ready, be prepared for what God's going to do in the last days with Israel, the land, and the people. Until next week, and we enter into another marvelous chapter chapter 55 until then shalom from israel well we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org again to find out more about us please visit our website loveisrael.org there you will find articles and numerous other lectures by baruch these teachings are in video form may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel.